Hi, we will uh, learn chapter 8, which is on Newton's law of universal gravitation. This chapter is very simple, actually. So I think it'll, this chapter won't be difficult. You know, people say that, I don't know if it's true or not, but people say that it, uh, Newton found this gravitational law by looking at this falling apples from apple tree. And this Newton's um, apple tree is very famous. There is original apple tree in Newton's old home. And many people, you know, took the apples from that tree and you know, grew the descendant of this original apple tree. You know, we also, I, I, as far as I know, we also have one at Kais. There's apples, uh, Newton's descendant of Newton's original apple tree in our campus. So what is Newton's uh, universal gravitational law? Found that any two masses, M1, M2, attract with a force. We know mass is related to the uh, inertia, so it's actually resistance to uh, acceleration with a given force. Mass is greater, then acceleration decreases. But not only the mass is related to inertia, but also it is basically generates force. So it does something different. So any two masses attract with a force. Okay? This is universal gravitation. So force is always uh, attracted. The direction is attracted force. And the magnitude of the force is proportional to the product of the two masses and inversely proportional to the distance squared between the two masses. And here G is constant of universal gravitation. In the lab, we will uh, measure this G. Very, because it's very small number, you see, it's very tricky to find this to measure, actually measure this constant. Without gravitational force, so for example, if you throw a ball, you know, due to the inertia, Newton's first law, without gravitational force, without any force acting on that ball, it'll move in a straight path, straight line. That's the Newton's first law. So you are here, okay, and you throw a ball. Um, if there's a, you know, this is Earth. If you throw a ball, then it'll fall down like this. And depending on the initial speed, if you throw the ball very, very fast with high initial velocity, it'll go further like this. Even with higher initial velocity, it'll go even further. Eventually, if you really, if you throw that ball at really high initial, so even if the gravitational force will pull the whatever object into a curve path, it's a special case when the initial velocity is large enough. So in this chapter, this, this is kind of one of the most important parts. Now we want to find the orbital speed and orbital period of circular motion. When the altitude is the, the distance from the center of Earth to, to that uh, object here, satellite is R, and the mass, Earth mass is large M. Let's say mass of this object, small mass, uh, mass of the satellite is small n. What is the orbital speed in, if the object moves in a circular path in orbital period? You can find it because by writing equation of motion, we know Newton's second law is force equals ma. Here, centripetal acceleration, we know v square over r is ma. And this centripetal force comes from universal gravitational force, right? between Earth and satellite. From this equation of motion, we can find V, which is orbital speed, is equal to square root gm over r. And also, we can find orbital period is how much time it takes for the object to move in one uh, complete circle, circular motion. How can we find the t? This is 2 pi r over t. From that, you can find that t square is actually proportional to r to cube. Because gravitational force is position dependent, this conservative force is easy to uh, prove you know, through a, a closed loop if you calculate the work done by gravitational force, zero. So gravitational potential energy, we can find from R1 to R2, and the only thing that matters in potential energy is the difference. So we can we can set the reference point in, in position anywhere for convenience. We want to make it, make this R1, the reference point, at, at a point where this becomes zero, so R1 infinity. So on the radial line for the same R, so regardless between this point and these two points in one, uh, potential energy doesn't change because potential energy is only a function of, of the distance, radial distance R. And as I said, it's convenient to take at infinite here, R1 infinite, as a reference point where potential energy is zero. So gravitational potential energy you can uh, calculate like this minus g m m over r between two of uh, mass. So, so this is gravitational potential energy curve, which is u is minus g m m over r. It's one of, minus one over r. At infinite it goes to approaches zero, and at zero it, it goes minus infinite. U goes potential energy decrease to negative infinite and as r approaches zero. And depending on the total mechanical energy, total mechanical energy, the motion changes. This motion of 
of this, uh, for example, here, if it's if this potential energy is between Earth and other, uh, for example, uh, satellite or uh, spacecraft, then the motion of the spacecraft is determined by the total mechanical energy of that spacecraft. If the total mechanical energy is greater than zero, that means the total energy is greater than the maximum of potential energy. So that object can move anywhere. However, if the total energy is E2, is less than zero, then because the total energy smaller than potential energy, which is this area here, this region here, this object cannot go there because reached above this radius because total energy is U plus K and K cannot be, K always should be greater than zero because it's one half MB squared, should be greater than zero. So because velocity cannot be negative, this is the maximum radius that object can go. So object is bound. Bound means there is a limit where it can reach. Okay. Above some radius, it cannot go. And most likely, it's elliptical orbit. Somewhere here, it can move back and forth. So in general, when the, the total mechanical energy is less than zero, then the general motion is following the ellipt elliptical orbit. When total energy is greater than zero, it, the orbit is unbound. That means it can go anywhere to infinite distance. Hyperbola, I thought it'll follow hyperbolic uh, path. And for special case, so between this open orbit and closed orbit is zero. When total energy is zero, borderline, this gives this parabola, parabolic orbit. We can prove this later if you learn classical mechanics, but right now we will just qualitatively, I will uh, just explain qualitatively. Circular orbit is very special case. Now here, we quantitatively, we only deal with uh, circular orbit in general physics. Uh, but beyond that, you require something, some more advanced uh, classical mechanics thing. Now let's calculate the total energy in circular, if the object it moves in a circular orbit. What is the total energy? Total mechanical energy consists of kinetic energy and the potential energy. We know gravitational potential energy is given by this equation. And from when the object moves in a circular path at a constant speed, we know centripetal force mv squared over r is equal to gravitational force r squared gmm. From that, you can find this mv squared is equal to gmm over r. And from there, you can find that total ener mechanical energy of an object in circular orbit is minus, exactly, see, this is one half u. From that, k plus u is one half u. So u is equal to minus 2k. This relation whole. From that, circular orbit, you can find, you can, you know, circular orbit, this u is always negative. So total energy is negative. So orbit is bound. And if r becomes smaller, lower the orbit, then total energy mm. is equal to uh, this. This is total energy. If r decreases, then E magnitude of total energy is becomes greater, but it's more negative. So that means it's more bound. So that means U is greater. So kinetic energy has actually increased with smaller R. If the circular motion orbit, the altitude is smaller, then to maintain the circular orbit, the speed should be greater. This is opposite to our common sense. So this means, for example, orbiting spacecraft need to lose total energy to gain speed. So for example, if this for this spacecraft, if they move at the same altitude, they will move uh, without any engine or anything. If they move uh, by just uh, centripetal force given by uh, the gravitational force, the speed will be the same. But to move for this uh, object to uh, this spacecraft to move faster to to catch up this, you know, this object, this uh, spacecraft should lower the, the, the altitude, okay? lose, lose total energy, to gain more speed, to increase kinetic energy. Kind of opposite to um, our common sense, but very, uh, if you know physics, then, then it's obvious. Escape speed is the speed, the minimum speed required to escape from Earth. So to escape from some planet, from an Earth, what is the condition? Total energy should be equal or greater than zero. And that spacecraft can escape to infinitely far from the gravitating center. So we can equate the total energy is equal to zero to find this escape velocity. Escape velocity is about, is equal to square root from this equation, square root two gm over r from at Earth's surface. The escape velocity is around uh, 11 kilometer per second by putting the Earth radius. The field concept is more convenient than the force concept. Force will always require some action, reaction, and so on. But uh, field concept doesn't require an action. So, for example, what is the field? Uh, at a given position, gravitational field is defined as uh, force per unit mass. We just assume there is one uh, kilogram there. And then and what is the force acting on that uh, unit mass? Is that the gravitational field at that position? So near any mass, 
near a massive object, there could be gravitational field. It's similar to, for example, to, to imagine force. We require two mass. We, we can imagine force between two masses, but uh, to describe gravitational field, we only need one mass. One massive object creates gravitational field around the space near that, that mass. So it's actually the, the, the result is the same, but the, uh, the concept of description is different. So force always requires two objects, action and reaction, but to describe gravitational field, we don't require two objects, we only require one object, and it's basically more related to describing the space, not the action between two objects. At, at a given position, everywhere near a massive object, there is a, a gravitational field, and definition of gravitational field is uh, if imaginary unit mass exists at the position, what is the force? It will be definitely a ve vector, so we, we can, at every position, we can draw this kind of arrow, and by connecting all these arrows, that's a gravitational field line. If you are already familiar with electric field line, it's very similar. Field view is more powerful in describing interaction in physics. So more advanced physics is described by this field rather than force. And, and this is also, field view is consistent with Einstein's general relativity, because according to the general relativity, mass distorts space. Mass distorts space-time, and according to general uh, relativity, object always move in a straight path. Path is distorted, okay? It's a little bit different concept than uh, Newtonian space-time. According to Newton's law, the Newtonian concept, space is, is uniform, but force generates this uh, acceleration and curved motion. But it's very simple. It's just vector magnitude of force at a given position due to uh, unit mass. But again, this doesn't require two masses, just require one mass to describe uh, gravitational field. Okay, here's the end of chapter 8. Very simple, actually. We learned this law of universal gravitation with very small g. So, and also we learn in this chapter motion under gravity, unbound, bound motion, and concept of gravitational field. Thank you.